All things physical are information theoretic in origin, and this is a participatory universe. Observer participancy gives rise to information. And he went on to say later in the article, in the essay, um, it from bit, otherwise put, every it, every particle, every field of force, even the space-time continuum itself derives its function, its meaning, its every existence, even in some context indirectly, from the apparatus elicited answers to yes, no questions, binary choices. And he goes on later to stress the importance of counting. Now, in developing an approach to test his proposal, I love that he references William James, if you've read the paper, you've seen that, who's widely considered the founder of the field of cognitive science. And by the way, um, Wheeler also discusses a frequentist Bayes debate. And with respect to James, he writes, no tower of turtles advised William James. And then Wheeler says, existence is not a globe supported by an elephant, supported by a turtle, supported by yet another turtle, and so on. In other words, no infinite regress. No structure, no plan of organization, no framework of ideas underlined by another structure or level of ideas, underlaid by yet another level, by yet another ad infinitum, down to the bottomless night. To endless this, no alternative is evident but loop. Such a loop as this, and this is his proposal. Physics gives rise to observer participancy. Observer participancy gives rise to information and infor information gives rise to physics. And he sort of breaks, breaks that down in the article. Later in the paper, he poses a central question, a question that is the core of my research interests and in this talk. And it's also the question or a central question of collective intelligence. Journal was mentioned at the beginning of this um, presentation. How does the vision of one world arise out of the information gathering activities of many observer participants? But before we get to this question, I want to make a few observations. I often start my talks by saying, energy was at the core of 20th century science. And at the core of 21st century science will be information processing and computation and their relationship to energy. And I think Sean mentioned in the discussion the other day, something similar. Even though profound advances in understanding information, in particular relating entropy to uncertainty reduction were made by Shannon, um, in the 20th century, we still have no theories for the components of information, semantics, and function, as noted by Weaver, not Wheeler, Weaver in the Weaver Shannon monograph published in 1949. But as Wheeler makes, and as Wheeler makes clear, Wheeler, not Weaver this time, uh, we don't understand the relationship of information, energy, and physics, and certainly not in adaptive systems, and in particular, why information processing, which requires energy, ultimately seems to improve through computation the capacity of organisms to do work. Okay, so let's begin by stepping back to gain a really synoptic view. Physics is dominated by concepts like pressure, temperature, entropy, and these emerge through simple collective interactions and provide deep insights into the behavior of the physical universe. Biology, on the other hand, and that for me always includes ecology and society, makes use of comparable collective concepts, including metabolism, conflict management, robustness, for example, things I work on. Um, in, but in contrast to physics, these are functional properties, or they have functional properties. Now, physics produces order through the minimization of energy. Adaptive systems produce order through the addition of information processing. And why adaptive systems have this extra step and whether it makes them fundamentally subjective, uncharacterizable by laws and unamenable to prediction are some of the big questions that we're all dealing with. Okay, so in trying to understand the relationship between micro and macro and how to predict at the macro scale, um, the history of physics, namely the debate between thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, focuses our attention, in my opinion, on three questions. And these questions here on the slide, do we observe predictable relationships among macroscopic variables? And um, one example of that is the ideal gas law, which is an equation of state, in which the amount of gas, the number of moles, is determined by its pressure, volume, and temperature. Another question is, are these macroscopic variables fundamental? Can they be derived from the microscopic? We're going to come back to that quite a bit in this talk. If so, we can say the relationship among the macroscopic variables is law-like and describe the macroscopic state of the system. As David mentioned the other day, this debate about micro and macro and how important it is to attend to the micro 
has been playing out in evolutionary theory. You can also find it in economics and many other disciplines. As David mentioned in the study of social evolution, macroscopic variables like R, B, and C in the kin selection models were for a long time implicitly assumed to be fundamental with no attempt to first show they were justified by deriving them from the micro, from say population structure in the case of kin selection. This debate came to a head um, in a publication that David also mentioned with a controversial main paper and a very good appendix in our opinion by Yeo Wilson, Martin Novak and Christina Tarnita. And I won't go into um, details today about this paper, but I just want to point out um, that this talk is really about showing why deriving macro from micro is so important when information processing seems to play a big role in generating ordered states. And as an example of both how deriving my, uh, macro from micro in biology can be done, so like the practice of it, so to speak, and as an example of why it needs to be done, let's consider very briefly some of the groundbreaking work on scaling by Jeffrey West, Jim Brown, Brian Inquist, Luis Betancourt, Dan Savage, Chris Kempe, and many others. Okay. So for me, one of the major insights arising from that body of work, which is obviously still ongoing, is that scaling laws change when information processing and collective interactions become important. When energy dominates, as in the case of, um, on the elephant slide, scaling left and right is a real challenge for me. So don't pay attention to that if I get it wrong. Um, so uh, in the case of scaling, uh, mass and metabolic rate, the scaling is sublinear. There's an economy of scale. The average elephant weighs 220,000 times the average mouse, but only requires about 10,000 times as much energy in the form of calories as the mouse. In contrast, in social systems, the analog to mass and metabolic rate, population size, and something like patent generation, shown on the other slide, um, scale super linearly. Okay, so that's 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 the first sort of interesting thing. Now. There's an increasing return to scale in, in, social, in the social systems in the information sort of collectivity case. The metabolic scaling relationships at the macroscopic level have been derived by Jeffrey and crew um, from axioms or mechanistic first principles relating to the fractal structure of the circulatory networks responsible for distributing energy in organisms. Now in the superlinear case, we don't yet know how the macro derives from micro. They've made a lot of progress on this, but they're not anywhere near done what the fundamental macroscopic variables even are, or what the right microscopic input is. The theory is in progress, and one reason for that is we don't understand how information, in my opinion, how information processing and collective effects, which play a substantial role in these systems, factor in. Now, the distinction is not really between biological systems and social systems, as my characterization and the literature often suggests, I think, but between energetic variables, variables under strong energetic constraints, and have been optimized to satisfy them and those that are informational in nature. Okay, so it's worth reviewing a little bit about biological systems. Um, informational variables arise when decision-making by, com by components in learning developmental time is error-prone and heterogeneous. And reasons why decision-making is error-prone and heterogeneous include things like, and this has, these have come up in, in other talks, finite computational capacity. Uh, Steve and Wolfram mentioned that multiple times partly aligned interests, different windows on the world, different developmental stages, and so forth. Now, given all of this variability, you might think that it's amazing that there are ordered states at all. And, you know, in some sense, that's, that's, that is amazing. Um, however, as we all know, you know, uh, noise can be critical to generating ordered states and amplify signal and so forth, or can do. Um, and in addition, Though biological systems are out of equilibrium, they have multiple space and time scales. And this multiplicity of scales creates, in, in, um, you know, this is an idea in our work, this multiplicity of scales creates what we might call an effective equilibrium state. For example, properties of social structure persist relative to the lifespan of components and component behavior fluctuates. And the key to understanding in such system lies in this proposal. Components as imperfect information processors must collectively compute their macroscopic world. Sometimes recovering ground truths and sometimes creating new ones and sometimes just getting it wrong. 
This collective computation to channel Wheeler and Wolfram in his talk the other day means that for prediction and control, we need to consider the system's point of view. Okay, now to really hammer home the implications of these properties of biological systems, I want to explicitly dispel a myth in this talk. My colleagues and I are writing a paper now um, in which we argue that the idea that complexity emerges from simplicity in nature is for the most part wrong. So this is like the mantra of complexity science. And you know, it's, it's true that it can, you know, Conway's game of life is the perfect example of this, but it's not the way it works in, in, in biology, we think. Um, this is not the talk in which to make this argument. And you know, we're not really ready to yet, we're getting there. So for now, I just wanna point out a couple of facts. Biology is replete with rich empirical um, um, descriptions of the microscale, of the individual level. There's complexity at a wide range of, of scales and um, systems from molecular to the social. Just consider a few facts again. Um, the human body has 38 trillion bacterial cells, 30 trillion, so it's about one to one, self cells, 86 billion of which are neural cells. There are 8.6 million people in New York City. Just think about the comp compounding here. Now that's just, those are just numbers. But you know, if you still have doubts, if you're not convinced, consider that the macromolecule, this is a cell, it's, this by the way is from a, a textbook called Smart Biology, which I highly recommend. It sort of changes the way you see um, other levels of organization once, once you start looking at these amazing uh, reconstructions. Um, so a typical macromolecular composition of, of, a, of, a, of an E. coli is 3 million proteins, something like 260,000 RNAs, 2 DNA molecules, 20 million lipids, 1 million liposaccharides, and so forth. Um, ATP molecules to build and maintain it with three times, you know, 10 to the ninth glucose molecules required per cell and so forth. And there's a great book on, on the sort of numbers of biology. I think that's roughly its title that I, um, it's a couple years old now, so it's probably already out of date, but it's, it's useful. Now packing in these cells is highly optimized. They're, as you can see, densely packed. Um, even simple prokaryotes like bacteria have complex internal structure with membrane bound organelles that can sequester genetic information. Um, allow nutrient digestion and synthesized molecules, so it, sort of complicated functions. A typical axon of a neuron, thought to be one of the most mechanically complex cells in the body, has something like 1,000 to 10,000 synapses, and a single neuron contains about 50 billion proteins. Dendritic action poten potentials in the human two-third cortical neurons can compute now, we know it was theoretical, but now we, I was shown last year, can compute the exclusive XOR function. So, so all the scales are complicated, except perhaps the very origin of life. And, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. Somebody like Sarah Walker or Chris could comment, but I, I suspect there's more complexity there too. Okay. So the, the point here is that coarse graining in such complex environments is non-trivial. And error and bias in information processing occur at all scales. And to illustrate this point, Consider the famous video, which I'm sure many of you have seen, that comes from um, Shavri and, and Simmons uh, on selective attention. So if you, I've just got snapshots of the video here. Basically, this is from study of human cognition. Basically, um, they set this experiment up in which they videotape people playing basketball. And I think there's uh, people in white shirts and they have to pass to each other and people in black shirts have to pass to each other. And you're to told as a watcher of the video to count the number of, of passes. And during this video, a guy walks through the basketball passing in a gorilla suit. And pretty much nobody in the audience sees the gorilla. They only see, they only do their job. They're trying to count those basketballs moving in a sort of confusing environment. And then, you know, and then the gorilla is revealed and everyone's shocked. So a few concepts we need to have at hand to understand the point about complexity here. What is the environment? Well, it's either some kind of ground truth like in this particular image, it would be something like the elevator, the height of the elevator in the background. That's a kind of ground truth. It's exogenous to the system of something over which you really have no control. Or it's something that's computed by agents in the system, like the strategies employed by the opposing team on a basketball court. What is error here? Well, for me, this is how I define error. Error is deviation from theoretically maximum regularity that could be extracted from the environment given its structure. What are sources of error? We've gone over this a little bit already finite computational capacity, intrinsic difficulty of separating signal from noise, so the nature of the regularity, scale mismatch, if you know, it's hard to see if you live on the order of a, you know, a couple of days, it's hard to see events that transpire on the order of years, climate change presents some problems on that way. Um, 
biases like selective attention as illustrated by the Shabri video. Now, a caveat, uh, um, some evidence, there is some evidence for optimal information processing in biology. For example, the work of Bill Bialak and others on Drosophila lar larval development um, and the use of diffusion gradients by cells to determine where to make, say, the stripes that later in development um, demarcate the positions of uh, uh, the positions at which body the body divides into segments. Um, so there is work. So this is an open question, like how optimal is information processing in biology? And I think I think it's fair to assume that the majority of information processing in the absence of a lot of studies on this is not optimal, but that is an open question. And it's such an interesting one. It's amazing. It hasn't received more sort of comprehensive attention. Okay, but let's just assume that the majority of information processing is, is at least at some point in its evolutionary trajectory error prone. It has to be refined to get to that perfect state, except in maybe exceptional cases. Now, such error prone information processing produces what we might call effective theories. And I'm going to define that uh, more formally in a second for how the world works. These effective theories are used by the components and the systems that produce them uh, to guide behavior and strategy. But of course, because of the error in the information processing, the effective theories can be wrong if they are informed, say, by coarse grainings that are wrong. Now, yes, some of you might be saying, well, coarse graining cleans up stochasticity and noise, um, but coarse grainings have to be computed. And if the computation itself is error prone or uses the wrong data, then the coarse graining can be wrong. Okay. So in systems that are energetically constrained, information processing introduces subjectivity. Now, a natural question is to ask how nature overcomes subjectivity to produce ordered states. Our proposal is that adaptive systems overcome subjectivity by estimating regularities, these coarse grains, creating a macro scale, and the coarse grains feedback through a downer causation, and I will be defining that later in the talk, changing component behavior and allowing the collective computation of solutions to environmental challenges in, in evolutionary and learning time. Okay, so what exactly is coarse graining? So what is coarse graining? Like Mondrian's a tree series here, this, he's a painter, um, he captures it well. It's the essence, it, it's the essence of a thing or a process by putting out of focus irrelevant details or the fluctuations. Now, why is this important? The second law of thermodynamics states the entropy of the universe is increasing. And as it does, at least some of the detailed information we initially had about the system is lost. This makes prediction about the behavior of the system difficult. And my interest in this is twofold. First, how can we improve our capacity to make predictions under this condition? And second, how can we reduce entropy locally to increase the capacity for prediction locally? Now, additionally, classical fluctuations at, uh, at the micro scale, small, fast time scale, changes in component behavior can make reliance on microscopic behavior for macroscopic predictions difficult, as we all know. And relying on the macroscopic behavior for prediction can require specifying, the microscopic can require specifying many details. So not particularly compact. Ideally, we would like our predictions to be based on a compact description of theory for system behavior. So for these reasons, to make good predictions, we can move to what's called a coarse grain description in which some of the microscopic detail has been smoothed out. So let's think about temperature for a moment. And if you haven't read the book, Inventing Temperature by Hasek Chang, I highly recommend it. It gives not only a good intuition to all of these issues, but a very nice overview of the history of physics that I mentioned earlier, that sort of thermodynamic statistical physics debate. So temperature is the average speed of particles in a system, and a temperature is a coarse-grained representation of particles' behavior. The particles in aggregate so to speak. So when you know the temperature, you can use that to, to predict the system's future state better than you could if you actually measured the speed of an individual particle. Now, um, temperature can predict the future state of the system, assuming it's at equilibrium, of course, more computationally efficiently require, because it re requires fewer degrees of freedom. This is why coarse graining is so important. An effective theory allows us to model the behavior of a system without specifying all the underlying causes that lead to state changes at the macro scale. So effective theories by definition are agnostic to system mechanics and sometimes can even be wrong about them. Now the effective theories of interest here are those that have a basis and mechanism, but nonetheless ignore many of the, de of the details. Having a basis and mechanism is a critical property of a coarse grain description that is true to a system. It's a simplification of microscopic details. It's not a, a substitution. 
In principle, a coarse screen description does not introduce any outside information to the subset of microscopic interactions. This lossy but true property is one factor that distinguishes coarse graining from other types of abstraction. It's kind of an interesting point, which we can come back to. A second property of coarse graining that is that it's an integration over component behavior. An average is a simple example, but more complicated computations are also possible, as I'll discuss. And there's, of course, a huge body of work in physics, statistical mechanics, but how to coarse grain. And there's increasingly work in biology in which these methods are used to characterize the relationship between micro and macro and biological systems. And normally, when we talk about coarse graining, we mean coarse grainings that scientists impose on the system to find compact descriptions of sufficient behavior good for prediction. However, we can also ask, and I really think this is a difficult, different question, though they might converge, how adaptive systems identify regularities and build effective theories to guide decision-making behavior. Mm -hmm. So distinguish coarse graining in nature from coarse graining by scientists, we call coarse graining in nature endogenous coarse graining. So what I'm gonna do now is go through an example of endogenous coarse graining in an animal social system. And I'm gonna give you a bunch of details. Um, you can sort of you know, tune out if you want and, and tune back in later. I think it's kind of interesting. It'll help you get a feeling for what I'm saying. So. I'll try to do it compactly. Um, okay, so in most monkey groups, like the monkey group I'm about to tell you about, uh, it's a group of pigtailed macaques, there is what's called a power structure. You might have heard the term dominance hierarchy. It's kind of like that. We just think about things a little differently. So um, in our work, we operationalize power as the degree of consensus among group members that an individual can win fights. And that's the kind of operationalization that comes from, you know, um, really good work in the old sociology literature in particular um, from a guy named Bierstadt. And um, the, degree, the degree to which a group perceives an individual is capable of winning fights, mm -hmm. the, degree, the degree to which uh, the group collectively perceives an individual is capable of winning fights is encoded in a network of subordination signals. Uh, an individual sends a subordination signal during peaceful interactions to a receiver, it proceeds. <laughs> Cats are causing chaos. Uh, an individual sends a subordination signal during peaceful interactions to a receiver, it proceeds through a history of fighting as likely to win fights. Fighting is necessary because there are temporally stable factors such as experience and size, a blindness network, not just body size, and the influence of um, fight outcomes. And so here, here, for example, is a fight, a typical fight. I mean, fights often involve in this kind of um, monkey group, multiple individuals. This, this one just involves three, a juvenile and an adult, showing bi-directional aggression and an intervention by a third juvenile on the behalf of a first. OK. So the, in, the individuals learn during these interactions who they develop a perception for who can use power effectively. OK. This is uh, the, the female, the smaller um, monkey looking at the larger one with his back to us, is showing him or giving him the subordination signal. It's called in this kind of monkey um, society, uh, silent bare teeth display. And um, subordination signals formalize agreement. They're super interesting. They're coarse grained representations of a fight history that formalize agreement to a subordinate role in a dominance relationship, which is a kind of proto contract. And the signal is unidirectional. That means it's always given by the individual who perceives itself as weaker. That's very important because it makes it a highly reliable indicator of, um, of status relationship and, uh, and gives it the capacity to reduce uncertainty in the receiver about the state of the relationship. These signals are only emitted, as I said, when the sender perceives a large asymmetry in fighting ability. In other words, when it perceives that the cost of continued aggression is greater than the cost of subordination. The computation involves integrating over a history of fight outcomes, as I said, in order to compute and estimate the magnitude of the asymmetry. And the subordination signal serves as a coarse grained representation of the history of fight outcomes over some period. It stands in for that history. So fighting, of course, continues a little bit after the, the subordination contract has been formalized through the signal exchange, but at a reduced rate. And it, this continuation of conflict uh, fighting provides a mechanism by which the relationship might reverse. It's like a background process. And um, individuals appear to uh, roughly track the number of signals they receive from 
others, as well as the identity of the signal sender. And an individual computes its power score. That is, it gets, it estimates how the group perceives its capacity to, um, to use force, which is important because these conflicts involve multiple individuals. So it's not just, you, you, it's, it's, you have to know not just um, what, what one individual thinks of you, but what the collection thinks uh, when you intervene in these fights. Um, the individuals compute their sort of power status signal interactions or circuit rather the status signal interactions, which I've got represented here. So we studied a variety of algorithms that we posited the monkeys might be collectively using, that's important, collectively using to compute the distribution of power. And um, we tried to get a handle on their sort of cognitive, um, their, the cognitive burden they impose and their, uh, the, the robustness of these algorithms for cheating and other, and other factors in order to get a sense of how the system is performing the computation to obtain the distribution of power. And um, here on this slide, you can see the power distribution. So in, in these groups of monkeys, the power is distributed as heavy tailed. So there are a few monkeys who sit way out in the tail and they're disproportionately powerful or perceived to be so by the rest of the group who are kind of more or less similar. And what happens is this changes the cost function uh, of interactions. So this distribution, this heavy tail distribution changes the cost function of interactions. It lets the animals, it's a slowly changing variable Macroscopic variable now. It lets the animals estimate the cost, if they know their power score, the cost they'll pay for engaging in social interactions and particularly in conflicts. By, by reducing their uncertainty about cost, it opens the door to them to a new set of behaviors that they couldn't access before, either because they were too costly and they weren't sure whether they could afford to pay that cost, or because um, uh, it, the system hadn't sort of solidified the situation where most everybody's equal and, and there's a few people out on the tail. Okay, so um, what we've got here is the emergence of novel function as a consequence of a collective computation of a power structure that relies on these coarse grain signals of fight history. So we've got um, two emergent time scales and two novel functions, the policing uh, by the powerful individuals. And, and we've shown, I won't talk about this today, that this system, the policing in particular, has implications for many other um, uh, system dynamics, including robustness and growth. All right. So just to sort of uh, summarize a little bit, whereas the dominance relationship is formalized by the subordination signal and is a coarse grain represent representation of the fight history, a power score is a coarse grain representation of the signaling network, which encodes an individual's fighting individual ability as it's collectively perceived by the group. All right, so in case it's not obvious, it's worth noting that the collective computation in this example has two phases, an information accumulation phase in which the individuals like sensors are essentially gathering information semi-independently about who's capable of winning fights and a consensus or an aggregation phase in which that information is shared in a signaling network. Now, no, I say consensus, um, a consensus phase, but by that I don't mean the group comes to a single opinion. It's an interesting question about when that happens. But in fact, the network encodes a distribution of views mm -hmm. as to, um, as to an, an individual's ability to use force. And the power score is, captures that collective view implicit in that. So core screening happens both during the information accumulation phase and the aggregation phase. And one reason that core screening allows individuals to make predictions, say, about cost without requiring they indefinitely store all of the details of their interactions um, is that it's reducing uncertainty about the future. So once they've signaled the time series of fights leading up to the signal canyon principle, we don't know exactly how this works, be deleted from memory. So going forward, individuals only need to retain the signal, which summarizes the history of fights leading up to the signal exchange and the outcome of any new fights. And hence the course screening may allow kind of memory minimization. We don't know, it's like a speculation. A second reason course screening is advantageous is um, it allows individuals to identify slowly changing regularities that, and I alluded to this earlier, that may not be evident in the fine grained social interactions if these fluctuate for transient or contextual reasons. As fights do, individuals suffer a loss because they're sick, not because they're not the better opponent. There's, you know, there's a role for luck here, an important role for luck here. Okay, so now an important subtlety that I'm going to return to at the end of the talk is that even though 
the signal to noise ratio is higher in uncertainty about what constitutes a good, uh, I'm sorry. Um, even though the coarse grain is lossy, from a functional perspective, information is gained. Okay, so coarse grain is lossy, information loss, but from a functional perspective, perspective, information is gained. And that's because the signal to noise ratio is higher with the coarse graining about the cost and uncertainty about what constitutes a good strategy decreases. So we get this, we get this sort of, um, uh, that I'm, I'm gonna come back to more formally later, this sort of um, change in information channels. So the coarse graining is lossy, but it allows the opening of a new information channel at the macro scale, which facilitates prediction there. And that, that comes back to um, the sort of micro macro points I was making earlier in the talk. So I'll expand on that later. Okay, so both the accuracy with which the power distribution recovers the true underlying distribution of fighting abilities, which are invisible to the monkey and only accessible um, through inference that comes in the fighting, um, and the skewness, the heavy tailed nature of this distribution in this group are functionally important. A power distribution is going to be a reliable predictor of interaction costs if it has high mutual information with the underlying fighting, uh, fighting ability distribution. And I'll break this down also later. Okay, so, and the right skewness, the heavy tailedness of the power distribution in this case, as I um, discussed, influences conflict management, such as policing, making these things, making policing, which was not accessible as a strategy prior to this distribution, now available uh, strategy to use. There are individuals who can afford to pay it, and that's only a consequence of this sort of voting process through the status signaling. All right. So, The system is exhibiting what I call apparent downward causation. When the power distribution has consolidated enough, so it's built up enough so that changes, it changes more slowly than the microscopic fight behavior producing it, the strategies that go into those fights. And at least one individual uses estimates of its power score or other properties of the power distribution like skewness to make predictions about interaction costs and team behavior. Apparent downward causation. You just need one individual doing it is my suggestion. Now the system begins to show what I call effective downward causation when the collectively estimated power scores or other properties of the power distribution like skewness um, are robust to small perturbations in signaling patterns and have a slower time scale than the fight outcome network. And importantly, um, when individual estimates of the power distribution start to converge. This came up in Stephen Wolfram's talk, and it came up with Wheeler in, in a quote from Wheeler that I used at the beginning. So as individual estimates start to converge because data history builds up and because pr presumably they have some similar computational capacities, um, then we start to see what I would call effective downward causation. So they're using these estimates, their estimates, their power and everybody else's um, to make decisions to tune their behavior. Okay. Now, um, of course, this process can go awry, and and so it's important to assess. And um, so it's important to assess, you know, with mutual information or some some other information theoretic measure, how good the recovery is of of the ground truth in the environment or of the underlying distribution of fighting abilities, a socially computed um, variable. Um, you know, using these information theoretic tools, and I think the probability of convergence on similar estimates increases. Um, in this particular case, as um, in addition to similar computational capacity and data availability, as the fight outcome network is becoming fully connected. So as, um, as the lower level circuits and networks in this, these systems are building up, meaning all individuals have essentially fought each other. And as individuals um, come to have similar size data sets on fight outcomes, and um, when they're social learning, and when they can observe others and gain information that way, so we can state this as when individuals have an incentive to ask, estimate, to accurately estimate regularities, they will also, we will also see a, a convergence in these estimates. When it's important, it's just like a signaling argument, when it's important to get it right, there'll be more selection uh, for getting it right. Okay. So what are the generic features of the system that I just described? I gave you a lot of details on uh, monkey behavior, um, but we can put this in much more generic terms. 
So this is essentially a slide about how the downward causation through collective computation of these core screenings happens. Um, my schematic, which I'm going to go through now, is um, unfolded in time, essentially. And so what we have are um, the Ws that you can see here. The Ws are the perceivable states of the world. So you know, not the entire environment, but um, the subset of the environment that's in principle perceivable to the components of this system. And it can be, as we discussed um, earlier, exogenous ground truth, like that height of the elevator, the height of the Eiffel Tower, things that are outside of our control, or an endogenously computed variable, like the underlying distribution of fighting abilities comes out of um, you know, the social dynamics. The axes are a microscopic circuit, is a microscopic circuit composed of sensors or individuals with opinions or strategies about W. Okay, so that's like the signals in my example. So why are the macroscopic variables re uh, resulting from algorithmic aggregations of X? So um, Y would be the power, the distribution of power scores resulting from different algorithms applied to the X's opinions and the structure of those circuits. And the Z's are outputs made possible by the Y. So the Z's are um, the, the animals, in the case of my example, assessing the cost as a consequence of knowing something about their and others' power and making decisions about how to translate their power and the cost they'll pay into um, behavioral decision-making strategies. So the P is supposed to represent um, perception. It's essentially the neural algorithms that map the state of the Ws onto the sampler's X. And um, A are the social algorithms that map X into Y, the aggregate variables and macroscopic variables. And B, again, are like neural algorithms that map the perception of cost and power onto the behavioral outputs. All right. So this is our little collective computer. And um, the downward causation, because this is unfolded, is coming in in the effects of Y on X and Z on W. So you can think of Z as W prime, if you like. So if W is exogenous, if, if the environment is the thing in the, that we're interested in gaining information about is exogenous and out of our control, we'll call them Ws. And if the environmental variable is being computed by the system, we'll, we'll call them W prime. And they'll be over here like the Zs. OK. OK, so let me just review um, downward causation. So downward causation is historically controversial idea that higher levels of organization can causally influence behavior at lower levels. And to summarize a long and very convoluted debate, downward causation suffers from the criticism that it's not materialist, among others. As the argument goes, higher levels of organization are just temporal and um, spatial patterns that are the outcome of dynamics at a lower level and as patterns, they have neither material instantiation or agency and can't be causes. I'm simplifying a bit, but of course, this criticism itself suffers from the criticism turtle way, turtles all the way down to return to uh, Wheeler and William James. Now, in this talk, I propose that we can gain traction on downward causation by being operational and thinking about how adaptive systems identify regularities in evolutionary learning time and use those estimates, those coarse grains to guide or tune behavior. I suggested that many adaptive systems, in many adaptive systems, components are collectively computing their macroscopic worlds through coarse graining. And I, and I said that we move from something like simple feedback to downward causation when components to behavior in response to estimates that are collectively computed. And implicit in my presentation today are the ideas that for tuning to be possible, the coarse graining the coarse screenings need to have slow time scale compared to the macroscopic behavior producing microscopic behavior producing them and a computation <clears throat> that's used to estimate estimate them and i think that second thing is often forgotten in these kinds of discussions the, the computation can go awry we're going to return to that um, in a little bit so now another important thing to keep in mind is that adaptive systems, biological systems, social systems are collective, meaning that there are multiple semi-independent components making decisions and contributing to system dynamics. It's not, um, it's not necessarily, perhaps it's rarely the case that all components receive regularities of, um, similarly or estimate them similarly. 
Wolfram brought this point up repeatedly in his talk and David alluded to it. So this heterogeneity, subjectivity and tuning to aggregate properties is particularly likely when learning plays a big role. So learning can sort of speed up the, you know, observational learning can speed up the access to patterns or um, estimates, but, but if there's variability in how individuals learning, that's gonna also introduce heterogeneity. So that's why I've made this distinction between what I call apparent and, um, and, and effective downward causation. They're weak and strong forms. And I use the term apparent when tuning is essentially partial and imprecise. In the weaker minimal form, only a few components need to be tuning their behavior for the estimates of these aggregate properties um, to have some downward effect. So there, and, and so let me be very clear, the components by making these estimates are essentially reading semi or more global um, properties of the system. And in doing that reading are generating the cause, okay? Apparent downward causation doesn't demand that the estimates be correct or even good predictors of the system's future state. Furthermore, components don't have to agree for apparent down causation, the estimates of these variables. What matters is just that there is some tuning. Okay, so this allows exploration. This allows exploration and um, transitions to effective downward causation uh, when the, the strong form, when the following um, when the following properties are satisfied. The aggregate properties are predictive of the future state of the system. They're slow variables. They're robust to small perturbations. I mentioned that earlier. The estimates of these variables are nearly universally um, by, are nearly, are used nearly universally by all components to tune, okay? So they're using the estimates, whether they're right or not to tune, by almost everybody's using them. Components largely green their estimates of these variables. And the estimates, as the estimates converge, there should be an increase in the mutual information between the microscopic behavior and the macroscopic properties. So as with, as with apparent downward causation, under effective downward causation, components need not be in agreement about how to tune. The degree of agreement will depend on whether decision-making is influenced by other types of heterogeneity, for example, resource heterogeneity, and, um, and there may be strong constraints that the system's under and so forth. High agreement, high heterogeneity, high homogeneity in strategy would, would most likely make the sen system sensitive to perturbations and move it toward a critical point, which can have all sorts of robustness implications. So there's, you know, follow, um, there are all sorts of, um, you know, other implications of this that we could discuss um, if there were, you know, if there was time or interest. So notice that by operationalizing apparent, apparent and effective downward causation as described above, we avoid violating that materialist requirement I started with because the components are tuning two patterns they perceive and hence are doing the work, right? That's the reading. Okay. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned system performance. That's how the system can assess its um, question, how the system assess its performance is an open one. Another way of asking this, oh, which gets to um, another talk that I give, uh, I've been working on, which is the elements of collective computation in nature is, um, is there an effective termination criterion in biological systems? So a termination criterion is sort of tells programs when to stop running in computer science. I won't get into this in any detail today, um, but, I, but I will provide um, a work in progress hint, so to speak, at how we think about this issue. <clears throat> and, and given um, this framework that I've been, I've been advancing today. I've said a couple of times that slow variables like the power distribution are advantageous because they reduce uncertainty and afford predictability, providing by providing essentially a stable background against which components can tune strategies. But how do we know whether these strategies are good? How do we know whether they're adaptive? How do we know whether that power distribution is appropriate given the challenges the monkeys face in their social dynamics? Um, do they fit? Do the, do the computed variables fit the environment? Um, so in brief, we think and have used information theoretic concepts like mutual information and its variance to make this assessment. And I've got here um, just the schematic that I already showed you. And by the way, the red um, lines in the X box just are to indicate that there's structure in, um, there's essentially a circuit there and there's structure to that circuit that matters. <clears throat> so we can make comparisons between um, 
say, mutual information of um, the resulting power structure, in the monkey case, the Y is the distribution of power, and ask whether it recovers the W, which in that case was the underlying distribution of fighting ability. And we can compare other this, this information theoretic quantity to other um, to others and ask in doing so, how much how much of the fit is due to collective effects versus um, individual effects and perception? Um, and we, we can ask, um, you know, how, how, um, how to intervene on the collective computation to make changes um, to macroscopic, the emergent macroscopic properties. So by, by doing these information theoretic comparisons between the X and the Ws and the Ys and the Xs and so forth, we get these different quantities that give us this amazing, um, this amazing power to ask questions that we couldn't ask before. Okay, so as illustrated with the monkey case, this policing behavior this is, is, is emergent in the sense that as a consequence of, of, of computing that heavy tail distribution of power, the monkeys get this conflict management strategy that can only be performed by a few of them, the very powerful ones, but which is good for everyone because it causes fights, it keeps fights from getting out of control and the monkeys who use it do use it impartially. So it does benefit those monkeys to a greater extent than the others, but everyone is benefiting. Um, so we have this novelty that uh, is arising in the system as a consequence of these coarse grainings and, and collective computation of the coarse grainings. And the basic idea that I've been essentially proposing in this paper is that a consequence of integrating over these um, abundant microscopic processes, coarse screen variables provide better predictors at the um, of the future configuration of the system than the states of the fluctuating microscopic components. That's sort of no big deal. Um, you know, that should be true. And in but in doing so, they promote accelerated rates of microscopic adaptation. That's interesting, right? Now, I've said slow variables facilitate adaptation in two ways. They allow components to fine tune their behavior, one, and they free components, this is the aspiration point, to search at a low cost, a larger space of strategy for extracting resources from the environment. Now let's be a little bit more explicit about how uh, this might lead to new scales. As an interaction or environmental history, fight interaction, for example, or environmental history builds up at the microscopic level, the coarse grained representations of the microscopic behavior are consolidating, becoming for the components increasingly robust predictors of the system's future state. We speak, or we think there's, um, you know, this contributes to the formation of a new organizational level when, um, under effective downward, downward causation when these, these um, properties are satisfied. The estimates are good approximators of the idealized aggregate um, properties, sum summarizing regularities in the system well enough to be useful for prediction. The aggregate properties are sufficient to predict system dynamics at the microscope scale. This is important. The system components rely to a greater extent on the coarse grained descriptions of the system dynamics for adaptive decision making than on microscopic behavior. That can, comes back to that transition in channels, information channels that I mentioned before earlier in the talk. There's a we're, we're going from a case where it's not only important to, to show that the macroscopic can be derived from the micro, so we know that they're fundamental, um, but to showing that the macroscopic, but that even that that's the case. And, and given that that's the case, the next question is, do we need to attend to the microscopic? So the first question is, are the macro variables fundamental? We derive them from the micro to show they are. The second question is, do we need the micro to make predictions at the macro scale? And so my Shannon slide earlier with the, you know, the different mutual information or information theoretic comparisons allows us to ask that question, allows us to, to assess in principle whether we can make this transition from incorporating microscopic details into our models at the macroscopic or screening off, to use a phrase Lee Altenberg introduced, screening off the microscopic and just using information at the macro scale to do prediction there, all right? It's, 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 a, it's a super interesting um, possibility, I think. Okay, so as I said already, uh, in addition to the, these properties, coarse grain estimates made by components are largely in agreement and there's mutual information, some degree of mutual information um, between that consolidating higher level and the underlying microscopic. Now, now I'm proposing that the consolidation of a new organizational level requires, in addition to downward causation, 
that component estimates of aggregate properties, either individually or collectively, are good approximations of the aggregate properties as computed by an observer with perfect information about regularities in the system. So here we're getting back to this idea of what regularities could be extracted if an observer had perfect information and using that as a bar to um, assess the goodness of the fit. The idea in some respects is that convergence on good enough estimates underlies non-spurious correlated behavior among the components. But um, we don't, what, an open question is what constitutes good enough, right? How, how much mutual information has to be maximized and what are there, are there gonna be other optimizations going on and how much do those other optimizations impact the extent to which mutual information for this particular, a particular case can be optimized or maximized. So this in turn increases to um, when this happens, an increase in local predictability and drives the construction of levels organization via what I've labeled here as a macroscopic expansion. So, um, you know, just to you know, revisit earlier parts of the talk, microscopic complexity is widespread. It's not uh, microscopic, you know, our view of, of cells as, as a cytoplasm with a few organelle blobs floating about in it is completely, and anyone who has that view, I had it for a while, is completely wrong. Um, the microscale appears to be in, in many biological and social systems very complex. There's this process of simplification through a coarse graining of all that complexity to find the regularities and the estimates. That's the hourglass here. And that coarse graining, that collective coarse graining, can sometimes lead to this macroscopic expansion where we get these beginnings of new levels of organization and functional novelty. Okay. Now, downward causation needn't be a mystical concept if we think about it. I think this way, if we think operationally about how biological systems identify regularities and use these to tune behaviors. In my view, there are two key questions for 21st century biology as sort of result from thinking this way. Um, what are the precise mechanisms by which nature coarse grains? And how does the capacity for collective coarse graining influence the quality of the effective theories that adaptive systems build to make predictions? I think that answering these questions, which are you know really hard and big, well, you know, there's a lot to them, um, will help us gain traction on some traditionally quite slippery philosophical things like what are natural scales of adaptive systems, and once we have a principal means for detecting these scales, or the individuality David worked, uh, David mentioned the other day is another um, is related to all this. We find regularities that suggest adaptive systems like physical systems can be explained by law. So it's part of the challenge, part of the reason why we haven't been so great at, um, uh, at enumerating laws in biological systems, because we haven't had the system's point of view. And we haven't taken into account how the, these biological systems are doing coarse grain. Okay, now um, I have two more slides. Um, I just, I want to step back a second and, and just point out, as some of you may, may have made this connection, and of course, there's lots of work on how nature coarse grains, you know, out there in the literature. It's just not called by that name. And it, the motivations for, for working on it are different than the ones I've laid out here for the most part, I'd say. So it's basically all of cognitive neuroscience interested in how we learn and update. It's in the Bayes and Frequentist debates about uh, to channel Wheeler and, um, you know, and uh, to channel Wheeler again. And it shows up in, in other literatures too. It shows up in the AI literature most closely in work that um, in which there's thinking about AI in terms of renormalization group and information bottlenecks. And I don't want to say anything about that today because my, uh, my, my, I'm, I'm working on, on updating that. Um, I did mention a little bit in a, in a paper I wrote that's up on the website. Um, but Tishby, you know, he came up with this concept of an information bottleneck and then and there was a special issue published on it in Entropy and David Wolpert and Artemy Kolchinsky and others have, have sort of, in, you know, pushed forward on, on that concept. Um, done some nice work. And so there's relationships to that in AI. My information hourglass is overlapping a bit with that notion of an information bottleneck. Um, and it shows up in the collective behavior literature in work on algorithms for coordinating swarms and, um, and in work on um, how this is sort of newer work, like I think Tannenbaum at MIT does some of this, uh, on how you do Bayesian updating in collective settings. So I'd love to talk about these related issues, but I'm, I'm just now in the process of bringing them together in a paper and I'm not really prepared to, but I wanna put them out there. So, you know, if you guys are making these connections, um, you know, uh, I can just reinforce that a little bit. Um, plus, I, you know, I've surely overwhelmed you with concepts, so too much for today. So um, 
I do, however, want to note one explicit overlap, and that's um, endogenous core screening has also been described in molecular systems where Walter, who's pictured on this slide, um, and his colleagues are referred to as internal core screening, Walter Fontana. And you know, a lot of my thinking uh, about this topic, and mo almost all this work that I'm talking about, I do with David, who spoke the other day. Um, well, my thinking on this topic is influenced by Walter, and you know he was thinking about these many conversations over the years at SFI about you know internal and endogenous core screening, and um, you know in his case you know this goes back to it actually relates to the computation foundations of computation um, elements of computation work I alluded to a couple of times. He's interested in that also, um, and so it goes back to his work with Leo Buss if you're familiar with that on on, on alchemy. But basically the idea is that in molecular biology, there's a huge space of possible protein-protein interactions, particularly in the case of cellular signaling. And one approach for dealing with the problem is, is of common sort of complexity, the kind of brute force approach, which is just explicitly enumerate every possible combination of molecular species. But that's computationally intractable, and it produces a space of protein-protein interactions that's much larger than the actual space we observe. And this particular you know, observation you know, is, reoccurs a lot in evolutionary biology. The space is sparse in some sense. Um, so it leaves us with a kind of incomprehensible and you know, unsatisfying description. And it needs to be simplified if we do it that way through tedious and what I would call often non-biologically principled dimension reduction. A second approach has been to identify rules that take into account the context in which particular protein protein interactions is actually observed, and then to use these rules in simulation to study how different cellular phenotypes are produced. This also has disadvantages, which include the higher level protein, protein units identified, may again be units that the system does not recognize or can't use, so it's not taking the system's point of view. So Walter, and this is sort of my description of, of what he's doing, he probably say it totally differently, amends this approach by adding the requirement that the only allowed molecular patterns are those that are the lowest resolution. I think this relates to the decomposability argument that Steve Wolfram was making, um, that uh, the system can handle. And he calls these units fragments. And fragments are molecular interaction patterns that are independent or non-overlapping, and critically, patterns that the system recognizes and uses. So you know, my point that I hope I've really hammered. They are sufficient higher level descriptions of system level dynamics. And the work provides a second example of how thinking about course training from the point of view of the system itself can help us understand key causal features generating macroscopic behavior. Now, it's not clear that Walter's work has anything to do with downward causation yet, because um, uh, the work on internal core screening has not addressed, for example, how the fragments are produced. To my knowledge, maybe he's doing this, I don't know, but I think I talked with him about it and I think he, he said no, not yet. Or he's not even sure it makes sense, but... Okay, so for my last remarks, I want to return to Wheeler to Wheeler with whom he started. And um, in the conclusion to his paper, he lays out what I think is incredibly, this is, I guess, what, 1989, prescient research agenda, presaging in it connections to AI and the science of consciousness. And many issues raised or that were implicit in this talk, like um, this was implicit, and I, you know, if I, I um, something I'll talk about down the road, uh, it, um, it's the idea that to make progress, we need to hybridize information theoretic probabilistic approaches um, and logic-based approaches of computer science. Um, David and I over the years have argued for an evolutionary statistical mechanics and adaptive statistical mechanics. This is sort of, you know, in that space. And uh, I think it's worth thinking about. And Josh Gorchow at Boulder is a computer scientist who used to be a postdoc at SFI is interested in some of these issues. Um, and also the need for a deeper theory of computation um, that you know applies and is more usefully broad, more broadly useful than what we're you know getting from Church Turing and von Neumann architectures and, you know in CS being borrowed by biologists. Um, so that's something we're we're very interested in, as I said, Walter's interested in. Um, and Wheeler recommends, and I quote. We need to survey one by one with an imaginative eye the powerful tools that mathematics, including mathematical logic, has won and now offers to deal with theorems on wholesale rather than retail level. And for each such technique, work out the transcription into the world of bits. Give special attention to one and other deductive axiomatic system 
which is able to refer to itself, one another self-referential deductive system. From the wheels upon wheels upon wheels evolution of computer programming, dig out, systematize, and display every feature that illuminates the level upon level structure of physics. Capitalize on the findings and outlooks of information theory, algorithmic entropy, evolution of organisms, and pattern recognition. So finally, let me just end with this, and this is probably my favorite part of this paper, even though you know it's, it's more of a sociology of science point than um, a point about the role of information. Wheeler suggests we celebrate the absence of a clean and clear definition of the term bit as elementary unit in the establishment of meaning, and he, that we reject that view of science, which used to say, define your terms before you proceed. The truly creative nature of any forward step in human knowledge we know is such that theory, concept, law, and method of measurement, forever inseparable, are born into the world in union. If and when we learn how to combine bits in fantastically large numbers to obtain what we call existence, we will know better what we mean by both bit and existence. <laughs>